esteemed guests, please welcome Chancellor Pradeep K. Kosla. Hello. Oh, it actually works. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome. Uh, and welcome especially to our Ravel medalists and all the honored guests. What I'm, today I'm gonna honestly read the remarks. This is such an amazing uh, function that I wanna make sure that every one of our honorees is recognized properly and adequately, both, right? And the best way to do that is for me not to just ad lib. Uh, I can ad lib by adding to it, but, but not, not just completely ad libbing, okay. So, welcome. Uh, so UC San Diego, since its very inception, has built a culture of interdisciplinary collaboration and discovery. And our faculty have been very unique in their understanding of the value of bringing diverse perspectives to the table to advance research, advance education, and solve for questions not yet asked by most people in the country, except at UC San Diego. Our faculty, as you well know, are committed to their research, to their mentoring, and doing all of this for the next generation of scholars and developing next generation of leaders. They're committed to advancing not just their areas of interest, but entire fields of study in ways that dramatically impact our quality of life, create access to information, and solve some of the biggest challenges facing society. So, it's not a surprise that our honorees this year, just like the past years, exemplify what makes UC San Diego both unique and great. These people are visionaries who challenge the status quo to build systems, to engineer materials, to anticipate future innovations, and to provoke us to ask hard questions. Their work has elevated the global prestige and distinction of UC San Diego and transformed their fields of expertise and many other fields of expertise. Throughout their careers at UC San Diego, our medalists today built a campus culture that encouraged collaboration and inspired discovery. Our medalists nurtured creative, creative exploration in ways that continue to benefit our students and their fellow faculty colleagues. And our medalists delivered on our founders' commitment to exploration and to discovery outside the norm to make this a very unique place, an experimental place as they called it then. These are conveners who found intersections between their own work and the work of their colleagues in other disciplines. They then collaborated to expand the impact of their collective work. They are creators who had the vision and the commitment to forge new paths where none existed before. And today, their impact on this university and on all of us is very deeply felt. So it is fitting that we honor these remarkable faculty in conjunction with our celebration of the founding of UC San Diego. And because they built legacies that will outlast them and be celebrated for many years to come, just as Roger Ravel envisioned, uh, so to our medalists, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Your presence on this campus made it a great place. You may not have felt it while you were present on this campus. I know it feels like a bureaucracy. It feels like you're not appreciated. But I can tell you, actually, it's indeed true. But in, in, in the present moment, it feels that way. But I can tell you, the, the, the system feels your presence. The system feels your presence. And the system, in this case, the campus, really appreciates your contributions and what you've done. And to our guests, I want to say thank you for joining us today. Uh, because these medalists, they were chosen by a committee of their peers, in case you did not know. So I don't choose the medal, I just say yes to the committee of the peers. Just like everything you see San Diego, I say yes to everything the committee recommends. <laughs> Pardon me? <laughs> Except when I sort of thank you, Mark. Okay, <laughs> well, are you on the list today? Okay. <laughs> so let's just move on, and it's my great honor today. Uh, now to introduce our Executive Vice, President, Vice Chancellor Elizabeth Simmons to recognize our campus milestones and anniversaries this year. Please, Elizabeth. Great. Well, thanks very much, Chancellor Kosla, and welcome again, everybody. It's a real pleasure to join you today as we honor some of UC San Diego's most distinguished faculty 
for their extraordinary contributions to our university community. Now, as I think people in this room would know, the Ravel Medal is named after one of UC San Diego's most revered founding faculty members, Roger Randall Duggan Ravel. And the medal symbolizes his philosophy behind great institutions, recruit the brightest minds, explore the unknown, and above all, advance knowledge to make the world a better place. Ravel was a truly visionary academic leader and a research pioneer who drove transformative changes locally and globally. Much of UC San Diego's success could actually be traced back to the strong foundation laid by Ravel and our other founding faculty. So today, we are recognizing UC San Diego faculty who uphold the, legend, the uh, legacy of the founding faculty and the steadfast commitment to our shared teaching, research, and public engagement missions. Each of this year's uh, uh, honorees was nominated very specifically uh, because of how they exemplify the values and the transformative impact that Ravel brought to our campus. I read, I read uh, a lot of nominations, and so I, I can tell you that this was very specifically part of the nominations of each of these, of these uh, honorees. And so what I want to say to our honorees today is that it's because of scholars like you that we continue to excel at a university, and that we continue to be able to attract new generations of faculty, new generations of researchers and postdocs and students who will carry forward your legacy and the legacy of Roger Ravel to truly deeply explore the unknown, to, um, to uh, look beyond conventional paths to try to change the world and to make a real difference in, in this world and this uh, world of our campus and the world beyond. So on behalf of the entire university, congratulations to you and thanks to all of you. We take pride in your efforts and in your accomplishments as Tritons. We um, especially are proud of the unique ways that you have continued the ethos of non-tradition and showed that that can really lead to success and to excellence. So I'd like to invite Chancellor Kosla back to the podium to introduce each of our honorees. Thanks so much. Thank you, Elizabeth, and I'm back. So today, we recognize four extraordinary faculty whose impact on our campus and our local and global communities has been felt greatly and, if I may say so, is immeasurable. They've been pioneers in their fields, widely recognized for their leadership and groundbreaking vision. The Ravel Medal was initiated to honor distinguished, sustained, and extraordinary service to UC San Diego. It was originally bestowed upon a non-campus member, and then I said no and changed the rules. <laughs> so now, so it is today, the medal is the highest award given by the chancellor to a faculty member for their significant contributions that have made UC San Diego what it is today. So it is, so it is bestowed upon emeriti faculty who have significantly advanced the mission of UC San Diego. This afternoon, we'll recognize four such faculty members. So let me start with the first one. Our first medalist is Eleanor, Eleanor Anton. Congratulations. So Eleanor joined UC San Diego as a founding faculty member of the Department of Visual Arts in 1973. She led the development of a very innovative MFA program that even today is among the top ranked of its kind in the country. Her leadership style, her commitment to her students, and her unique ability to combine pivotal political and current events with a diverse mix of artistic media has set her apart from any other artist of her time. Among the department's most sought after instructors, Eleanor helped create one of the first visual arts programs to offer a performance focus. She has been recognized with numerous accolades for her work, including a Guggenheim Fellowship and a College, of Art, College Art Association's Lifetime Achievement Award. Her work has been exhibited at such prestigious institutions as the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Jewish Museum, and the Museum of Modern Art. 
she has earned international acclaim for performances at the International Art Exhibition at the Venice Biennale in Italy and as far as the Sydney Opera House in Australia. So congratulations one more time and let's see the video and hear a little bit more about her story. Eleanor is probably the most fearless person I know. She was full of raw energy and ideas and irrepressible. Eleanor has inspired a number of artists that today are prominent in their own right. And I think she did that just by being herself. Eleanor is a force of nature. Okay, so help us get to know you. Who are you and what do you do? Well, <laughs> I'm an artist. Uh, my name is Eleanor Anton, and um, I uh, I f forgot what I do. Eleanor is one of the most important figures in art of the last decades, just because of the topics in the real world she takes on from gender, politics, feminism, to the way she mixes many media of art. Writing, drawing, acting, dance, film, all together. No one's done it like Eleanor's done. My credit. La, Louis, we have work to do. We must set our house in order. I always knew I was an artist. I think I was born knowing. I used to make up stories with my paper dolls. I spent hours going through with them as if everything was perfectly real. They had all sorts of experiences as I could imagine them at that age. I was very young. I think I lived more deeply with my paper dolls than I did out in the world. Conceptualism, feminism, and performance art are three huge impactful things that happened in visual art starting in the 1960s, 1970s. One of the things about these influential artists from this generation that Eleanor's from, they were really going against the grain. And I wouldn't be surprised if there were many moments of reprisal. And for these artists to sort of stick to this idea, stick to this work the way Eleanor has, takes a kind of toughness and a strong belief in what you're doing an ability to fight for it. There are so many things that make Eleanor deserving of the Revell Medal. She was one of the founders of a department that uh, is now ranked uh, among the best in the world. She was a phenomenal mentor to students who then became uh, phenomenal artists uh, of their own. Of course, uh, she was one of the leading artists of her generation, but she was also an impactful and continues to be an impactful voice in uh, recognizing that the arts uh, are not uh, closed in the ivory tower of the university, but even extraordinary experimental art uh, is there to make a difference. Eleanor Ampton made a difference. The most important thing Eleanor taught me was to be fearless. Art making is difficult because once you've made it, this art doesn't only belong to you, it belongs to the world. There's a sense of fear of failure or criticism. And Eleanor taught me to be courageous. She said, be brave. Who cares? Just do it. I've always known Eleanor as an ironic, funny person in general. It definitely makes you smile. <laughs> you look at so much of her work, but then your next immediate reaction is to take that apart, dissect what she's doing and understand the critique under it of gender stereotypes or her feminist politics and opening up the world to more equity. It's a quick movement from the grabbing you with, the, with humor and irony and then 
making you dive into all of these deeper, very, very essential issues uh, to our culture and time. I don't try to be funny. I think I just am. <laughs> Would you want to say anything about David? Ah, um, I was also extremely fortunate. I had a love life, a married life with a fabulous person, very creative, a great artist himself. He's a poet. Well, we both loved each other's work we affected each other's work in a very rich and creative way. As I've always been committed to the avant-garde and to the new, I would suggest do what you feel and want to do. And you don't always know what that is, but as you start to play out in the world with a different, in my case, with my different selves, I learned what what it was I wanted to do, and I, I played it to the full. Next medalist is Marta Kutis. Marta is a world-renowned researcher of the brain processes involved in language comprehension. She also is an accomplished and gifted poet who has been known to turn her scientific insights into rhymed stanzas. She has this remarkable distinction of serving 12 years as the chair of UC San Diego's Department of Cognitive Science. Credited with a long list of papers, Cited more than 60,000 times, Marta's co-discovery of the N400 brain response, which has been used in more than 20,000 research articles worldwide, worldwide since its discovery in 1980. In addition to directing the Center for Research in Language for more than 20 years, she also ran her own lab and served as chair, like I said, for 12 years. She has been recognized with Distinguished Career Contribution Awards from the Society of Psychophysiological Research, the Cognitive Neuroscience Society, and many more throughout her career. So let's take a look at the video and see what Marta is known for. Thank you. Marta's really a sweetheart. She's one of the most generous people I've ever met. Marta treated everybody the same. She would sit you down and say, what is it that you want to learn? And then she'd go about helping you do it. The Ravel Medal recognizes people with just long, durable, important careers, but also a level of service that's unmatched, that, that really describes Marta. Don't forget, whatever you see, it's an illusion. Your mind and brain are inclusion, a depicted fiction, some reality, some prediction. So don't believe everything with such conviction. There's always room for some confusion inside, contusion aside. I came here in 1978. I wanted to study people because I was really interested in creativity. Where does it come from? How do you decide that, you know, can you, is it something you have or is it something you create or I don't know. Yeah, I was Marta's second student. Marta's kind of, She's kind of a mom. She's a demanding mom, but she's also a really loving mom. And those two things in combination really are exactly what you need as a graduate student. You need someone who's gonna hold you to account, make sure you live up to your own expectations, but also support you completely along the way. To me, the people in the department were like my children. I was willing to fight to the death for them. On, and, and, I would, and I would always, always say the truth. 
I was very honest. In the early 80s, she conducted some studies, experimental studies, and showed how recording electrical potentials at the surface of the scalp, EEG, could be used to track neural activity as people process language, read sentences word by word. And the idea that you could have this kind of a, of a continuous window on the brain activity as the brain was making sense of language was, was remarkable. She's most known for her contribution to neurolinguistics. She's a neuroscientist, she's a physiologist, she understands the brain. Her work that she published in 1980 is some of the most stolen work today about how the brain integrates and deals with, with meaning, expected meaning, or maybe something that a contradiction or something that's unexpected. So of course, everyone asks, is this, is her work specifically just about spoken language? What about language? She's in a different modality, like in sign language. And in 1987, she published with two other authors a paper showing that if you sign a sentence with some sort of an unexpected word, like, I take coffee with cream and dog. There's a very sudden, what we call an N400 response, so it's very deeply a linguistic phenomenon, not just simply about hearing something, but it's about processing and making sense of, of language and making sense of meaning. When the department was founded, that created the, the foundation for the cognitive science department, and everything kind of took off from there. And so Marta was part of that original group that took whatever seeds had been planted over those years of informal discussion and turned it into a, a formal science and a, and a discipline all its own. It's hard even it look to take faculty from completely different areas outside of social sciences, like neurosciences, computer science, electrical engineering, and then bring all of these people together and make something coherent. That's not an easy task. In 1978, when Marta got to Hilliard's lab, there was no such thing as the cognitive electrophysiology and language. And now it's a, it's a booming discipline, specialization in the cognitive neurosciences. It's so big, it's hard to keep up with literature. I think her, her legacy is how to find the most important question how to plan your career. All of these, if you talk to all of her graduate students, they say the same thing. She was an amazing mentor. She gave everything she had. It's a very rare individual to guide a department from its infancy to something much bigger, much broader, more ambitious, and to have that kind of presence even, even to this day. She's not only extraordinary at investigating language, she's extraordinary at using it. There are so many answers, suggestions, but for which questions? Solutions, worries, resolutions, but for which queries? Thousands of pictures and as many words. Visual and phonological bits herded by experience, giving us the sense that hence is just around the corner, imminent, emergent, about to unearth the submerged meaning, the end, in sight. Okay, our next medalist, Lu Shan. Congratulations. <laughs> Lu is a world-renowned theoretical physicist whose famous Cohn-Sham equation earned a Nobel Prize for Walter Cohn, his colleague in developing the equation. This equation was not just a discovery in physics for physics' sake. It transformed the way quantum materials research was done. It has had a long-lasting impact and many implications across science and medicine, especially in new material design 
and drug discovery. Lou also served as a department chair for physics and the dean of the Division of Physical Sciences. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and Academia Sinica in Taiwan. Amongst his many distinguished accomplishments, he has been named a Guggenheim Fellow, a Bernd Matthias Fellow, Scholar, and Fellows of American Physical Society, American Association, American Association for Advancement of Science, and, and sorry, Fellows of American Physical Society and American Association for Advancement of Science and the Optical Society of America. So let's just take a look at Lou's story. Lou's a very kind person. He sometimes can be very critical. Lou has uh, a very interesting sense of humor. The students especially really appreciate it because his jokes are very sort of scientifically driven. Lou is in a great company of some very distinguished people here at UCSD. And so uh, Walter Kohn, who together with Lou invented the density functional theory, and that's what I want to say about Lou, that Lou looks like a giant, but he was giant among giants. I was born in Hong Kong and then graduated in a Chinese high school. Then I went to England. My education was in Portsmouth Tech, Imperial College London, and Cambridge. At Imperial College, I took math. But that's where, in the third year, I had a professor who later on got a Nobel Prize for what he did. So I became into like uh, physics, especially quantum physics. Professor Sham is probably one of the most distinguished professors in this university. He invented something called the density functional theory, which is a method to calculate properties of materials, of molecules, of drugs, of all kinds of things. It's a way to calculate them and use a computer to calculate them. It's the, the standard method that all over the world, physicists, chemists, biologists use it. And so this is a very important discovery, which actually gave the Nobel Prize to Walter Kohn, who was also a professor here at UCSD. It's very important to remember that in 1965, when Kohn and Shame came up with this famous equation, the computing power was extremely limited. However, I believe that Lou could see that in the future, the computing will develop to the point where this kind of computations become commonplace. So it's remarkable how discoveries that were made almost 60 years ago have very important impact on material discovery that we do today in the labs. The last time I looked at how many people were using those basic equations in computational packages, which was only a few hours ago, it was up of the order of 100,000 people. That's an astounding number of people uh, that have referred to that work. And that was way beyond anything that anybody could have predicted, even Lou. There is a lot of biochemistry applications that use that equation in order to predict the kind of molecules that can be used in the future to enable the health and environment and safety for humans without actually going through very expensive trials. And this is the technique. And it is not invented here at UCSD in Meyer Hall. And the Meyer Hall, in fact, was designated as a historical physics site because of the invention of the density functional theory. And so it's, if you go to Meyer Hall, you'll see a plaque there, the American Physical Society put on, on the building. Lou's probably most significant administrative uh, contributions were when he was dean. He recognized what we did in condensed matter physics could be spread to many other disciplines in the sciences and engineering, and he worked actively in trying to build those bridges. And the best discoveries nowadays come from collaborations between physicists and chemists and engineers and mathematicians. And so he found an institute that enabled those kind of interactions, that enabled new types of discoveries to be made. That was the vehicle to cause that interdisciplinary work. I like interacting with the students. I think the best time uh, I had uh, was that the first year graduate students had to take physics. He was very famous for teaching uh, courses such as quantum mechanics, which is basically the foundation of the equation that he's very well uh, known for. Some of my colleagues here, both in physics department and engineering, have been students who've taken courses with Lou and later went on to become professors. And there is no 
better way to honor him, I think, is by having some of these former students go to even greater uh, achievements and uh, essentially take the lead from, from Lou. So as the chair of thesis department, I look up to Lou as the former chair and as a role model. He became the chair in the 1990s. He oversaw an expansion of our faculty that was quite important at the time. We had a very distinguished faculty and that started decreasing and then Lou took upon himself to rebuild it. It was his, his role to build a strong, vibrant physics department, which is, you know, now it's one of the top departments in the country and I'm very proud of being part of it, of course. I was one of the nominators for Lou for the Ravel Medal because it just seemed natural. And how does it feel to receive the Ravel Medal? Well, I feel honored, yeah. Yeah, surprised. Our next medalist, Larry Smarr. Congratulations, sir. Please. Larry joined the UC San Diego Department of Computer Science and Engineering in 2000. And later that same year, he became the founding director of the California Institute for Telecommunications and Information Technology. We call it like CalIT, a partnership between UC San Diego and UC Irvine. During his 20-year distinguished career at UC San Diego, Larry grew the two-campus institution into a collaborative discovery enterprise that engaged hundreds of faculty, staff, students, and industry leaders. Today, we know this institute, it's UC San Diego instance of this institute, just this instance, not the UC, as Qualcomm Institute. It is a reflection of Larry's guiding principle and a powerful example of why we do what we do at UC San Diego. Larry felt strongly that public higher education institutions serve the public good and the community that surrounds, around, surrounds them. He has served as a principal investigator on four NSF research grants, designing and deploying NSF's largest distributed academic AI slash machine learning, big data cyber infrastructure in the US. He has become a pioneer in the quantified self movement, including personalized, it's a surgery, it should be medicine. I hope it's not personalized surgery. It is surgery? No, actually he did, but he did not do the surgery. <laughs> and he served on President Clinton's Information Technology Advisory Committee, as well as consulted with numerous other federal agencies. And let's take a look at Larry's impact and his contributions, please. One of the interesting things about Larry is that he has the capacity to create not just ideas, but entire institutions. He's a student, he's a student of all of us. And when you take someone who's a student and you take someone as brilliant as he is and someone who wants to help people, magic. It was Larry's drive to want us to embrace the information technology revolution, and he, he helped make that happen. My primary research field originally was astrophysics. I was asked to become the founding director of what became the California Institute for Telecommunication and Information Technology, which we call Cal IT2. It brings together over 200 researchers from computer science, engineering, natural sciences, social sciences. I am very much in the mold of understanding that the reason we have public universities is a social compact. The citizens will give the land, give the support for the university, but then they want you to take the innovations and apply them to the core areas of the economy, which used to be agriculture and manufacturing. So we realized that to be successful, we wanted to build an environment in which the innovators in academic research needed to get more tightly integrated. The project that I've most closely collaborated on with Larry started 
with a computing platform across the entire Pacific. But now the other universities heard about it, so now it's all the way to New York City, out to Guam, Hawaii, you know. And so this is a system that we now call the National Research Platform that's optimized for data science with artificial intelligence and machine learning built into it in a way that you can solve problems that you couldn't possibly solve with your own local environment. At this point in time, the National Research Platform manages hardware, basically, all over the planet from San Diego. It is a mystery to me how Larry is able to dive deep into very different subject areas. He knows in depth things that he can connect dots across areas that I do not know if any computer scientist in modern time can do that. When I came to UC San Diego, they were beginning to study the microbiome of humans. They live on your skin, they live in your large intestine, and they are an intimate part of what makes you healthy or sick. And so we started really digging into that. And I realized, isn't anybody recording that? Well, how do you record that? You record it by taking stool samples and then taking them over and put them in the sequencers and so forth. So I felt like somebody's got to do this. Somebody's got to go first. So why not me? So I started taking lots of blood samples. As I kept track of my own biomarkers, there was something pretty wrong with me. I mean, like my inflammation levels had gotten as high as almost 30 times higher than what is the upper limit for healthy. Fortunately, one of the areas of technology that CalIT2 had developed was virtual reality. So then I thought, well, you know, we could image my body. And pretty soon we had a transparent Larry in the walk-in virtual reality cave. And I could look at my colon, for instance, in 3D and my heart, my lungs and liver and everything like this. Eventually I realized that I was gonna have to have a surgical resection of about six inches of my large intestine, the sigmoid colon. So I started talking to Sonia Ramamorthy. Well, I didn't know what to expect. I, I knew who he was going into the clinic room that day, but I went into the room, introduced myself, uh, and uh, Larry had a PowerPoint presentation to show me about his disease process, his microbiome, and I'll never forget at the end of it, he asked me if I wanted to hold his colon. <laughs> I said, I, I sure, because I didn't want to offend him. And he had this 3D model of his colon, which was fantastic. <laughs> In a campus like UC San Diego, with a long tradition of interaction between engineering and medicine, I found great support from both the doctor side and from the innovators in computer science and engineering department, and that we could use the special facilities of CalIT2 to make this one-of-a-kind transparent surgery happen. And so uh, we did. When you work with him, he has the uncanny ability to bring out the strength that you may not realize you have. And so the idea of being able to help some of the most talented, dedicated researchers in the world, what what better thing could you do with your life? It's really wonderful to be able to wake up in the morning, every morning, and to think, what kind of miracle can we help make happen today? Okay, one more round, please, for everybody. I think listening to what these four amazing faculty members have done gives you some indication of 
the type of the quality of work our faculty do and really the reasons what makes us such a spectacular and a great place, right? So thank you all of you for being here. Thank you to our medalists uh, for joining us this afternoon to honor you. And let me just say one more thing, which is there's many people in the audience who are our, uh, past uh, Rebel medalists. The past and the present have to meet on the stage so that we can take one more picture of the past and the present. So please come on over. <laughs>